mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey. I'm the Executive Director of APA Ohio and Vice Chair of the New Urbanism Division. Uh, today, Friday, April 4th, 2014, we will hear the presentation, Promoting Active Communities Through Pedestrian and Bicycle Planning. For technical help during today's webcast, type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar to the right of your screen, or you can call the 1-800 number shown. For content questions related to the presentation, type those in the questions box also located in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen. We will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. On your screen is a list of the sponsoring chapters and divisions. I'd like to thank all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible. And today's webcast is sponsored by the Delaware chapter. For more information on the Delaware chapter, visit DelawareAPA.wordpress.com. For more information on all our chapters, visit planning.org slash chapters and about our divisions, planning.org slash divisions. And on your screen is a list of upcoming webcasts. To register for these webcasts, visit www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts. And to log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, visit your dashboard, planning.org slash CM, select your activities, select events, select Ohio as a filter, and select Promoting Active Communities. This webcast has been approved for one and a half CM credits for live viewing only. Some recorded webcasts are available for distance education. For availability of distance education CM credits, check the webcast webpage at utah-apa.org slash webcasts. And as a courtesy reminder, April 30th is the last day that you can catalog all of your CM credits. Of course, like us on Facebook Planning Webcast Series to receive up-to-date information on all of our upcoming sessions. And we are recording today's webcast, and it will be available on our YouTube channel. Just search Planning Webcast on YouTube, and a PDF of the PowerPoint will also be available at ohioplanning.org slash webcast presentations. All right, I'm going to turn it over to the Delaware chapter, but I'd be remiss if I didn't post this. Oh, my gosh, how'd this get on the page? Go Tribe! All right, I'm turning it over now to the Delaware chapter. Good afternoon. Good morning to those west of here. Welcome to this episode of the Certification Maintenance Webinars for the Continuing Education of Certified Planners from the Planning Webcast Consortium of Chapters and Divisions. I'm Jim Galvin, AICP, Professional Development Officer for the Delaware Chapter of the American Planning Association. Today we will present the activities of various entities to promote bicycling and walking in the state. This webinar will include descriptions from the City of Milford and Dover, the efforts of the Dover-Kent County Metropolitan Planning Organization, and the Wilmington Area Planning Council, as well as contributions from a regional planning consultant from Whitman Recquart Associates. Please participate in the discussion, asking questions or sharing your thoughts on the efforts presented this afternoon. This session may be counted for one and a half CM credits. Please remember to visit planning.org to update your credits after the presentation. Because of the nature of the presentation, we've pre-recorded elements. If you have questions or observations, type them into the chat box and we'll attempt to cover them when we go live. We'll begin with a presentation by Gary Morris, AICP. Gary has held several planning management positions in Pennsylvania and Arizona, the last being the senior planner of Surprise, Arizona, 
the sponsor I know for that large development everyone, this is a recording planning. right now, and it looks like he that the uh, City Plan images are not Milford. posting, so please bear with yes, us. He's retired and formed a small consulting firm, Delaware Neighborhood, specialized in comprehensive planning, recreation planning, and land use. Mr. Morris received his MA in Urban and Regional Planning from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. He's a member of the American Planning Association and the Institute of Certified Planners. In 2008, the City of Milford developed its comprehensive plan according to Delaware state law, including provisions for a preliminary bicycle plan. One of the things the city wanted to have in this comprehensive plan was a recognition of trying to connect points of interest through pedestrian walking or bicycle use. Hopefully people would use less vehicle transportation and either walk or use their bicycles. Milford's future land use map. Milford is a city of approximately four square miles and a population of approximately 10,000. This slide shows the location of the elementary schools by the green arrows and the star represents the downtown area of Milford and the location of the Riverwalk. These slides show the physical layout of the elementary schools located in the city of Milford. In the first phase, we wanted to connect the three elementary schools with the downtown area of Milford and Milford's Riverwalk. Just some basic information about the Riverwalk. This project has taken over 20 years and is a walk along the Mississippian River and consists of almost two miles of walkable pavement, benches, and overlooks. This slide shows the eastern part of the Riverwalk beginning in a nature area called Goat Island. The Riverwalk then works its way into downtown Milford. In its heyday, Milford was a large shipbuilding city. The various amenities that have been constructed for pedestrians and bicyclists recently along the Riverwalk. These yellow projections are called life rings and are found along the Riverwalk in case someone gets into trouble in the water. Banner Elementary School, which is located near the eastern edge of the Riverwalk. The Riverwalk begins here at Silver Lake. The Riverwalk goes through the center of town. The city of Milford has various celebrations, and one of these celebrations is called the Bug. Sorry, Bug everybody. Festival. I'm trying to get a hold of our other presenters. This again, this Main is uh, pre-recorded. I know there's no images. I'm getting a lot of messages. I'm trying to get a hold of our presenters so that they know that their slides are not showing. At the elementary schools, and either walk into downtown or use their bicycles. The other activity that we are trying to pursue is to locate a bicycle path along Airport Road from the center of town to the Boys and Girls Club. In phase two, with the cooperation of Denrec, the city developed a pedestrian and bicycle plan for the city of Milford. The existing bike lanes on Marshall Street, the bike lanes on Elks Lodge Road, the existing bike lanes on Rehoboth Boulevard. We also looked at existing conditions including schools, the library, hospital, as well as existing population nodes and future population nodes. This, this slide shows the mapping of places of interest in the city of Milford. And this slide shows the existing and future population nodes for the city of Milford. The final analysis for the pedestrian and bike. A major undertaking for non-motorized planning that was undertaken in northern Delaware was to attempt to find a suitable path.
Again, sorry everyone, I'm still trying to get a hold of them. It looks like they might have caught on that we're having some issues. Hold, hold tight everybody. Sorry, folks, we're still trying to get this fixed. Peter, can you hear me? If so, can you let me know that you can hear me? Everyone I know, we don't have any, we don't have any um, video, just audio. We know. We're trying to fix it. Hold, hold tight, everybody. Peter or the or group can can you please tell me that you can hear me? Yes, I'm here, Christine. Oh, wonderful! Oh, good. We yay! We finally got you. <laughs> we uh we over here. We've been trying to get a hold of you. We we don't see any video at all. Oh, that's interesting. Um, all right. Let me start PowerPoint again. Hold on. Okay, and and just just remember that um that you need to click that you accept to show your screen. You should see a pop-up somewhere saying that. There. Oh, yay! <laughs> you want I should start over? Um, I, I suppose that would probably uh, be appropriate since we, we couldn't see any of your slides from, from the beginning. Yay! We're getting all okay. these yays now. <laughs> My apologies to all and sundry. Let me start this from the beginning. All right. Thank you so much. Before I start, uh, can everybody see this? Yes, it looks wonderful. <laughs> okay. We'll All right, we'll let's roll. try this again, everybody. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon. Good morning to those west of here. Welcome to this episode of the Certification Maintenance Webinars for the Continuing Education of Certified Planners from the Planning Webcast Consortium of Chapters and Divisions. I'm Jim Galvin, AICP, Professional Development Officer for the Delaware Chapter of the American Planning Association. Today we will present the activities of various entities to promote bicycling and walking in the state. This webinar will include descriptions from the City of Milford and Dover the efforts of the Dover Kent County Metropolitan Planning Organization and the Wilmington Area Planning Council, as well as contributions from a regional planning consultant from Whitman Recquart Associates. Please participate in the discussion, asking questions or sharing your thoughts on the efforts presented this afternoon. This session may be counted for one and a half CM credits. Please remember to visit planning.org to update your credits after the presentation. Because of the nature of the presentation, we've pre-recorded elements. If you have questions or observations, type them into the chat box and we'll attempt to cover them when we go live. We'll begin with the presentation by Gary Morris, AICP. Gary has held several planning management positions in Pennsylvania and Arizona, the last being the senior planner of Surprise, Arizona, responsible for large development plans and recreational planning. He came to Delaware to become city planner for the city of Milford. He has since retired and formed a small consulting firm, Delaware Neighborhood, specializing in comprehensive planning, recreation planning, and land use. Mr. Morris received his MA in Urban and Regional Planning from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. He's a member of the American Planning Association and the Institute of Certified Planners. In 2008, the City of Milford developed its comprehensive plan according to Delaware state law, including provisions for a preliminary bicycle plan. 
one of the things the city wanted to have in this comprehensive plan was a recognition of trying to connect points of interest through pedestrian walking or bicycle use. Hopefully people would use less vehicle transportation and either walk or use their bicycles. Milford's future land use map. Milford is a city of approximately four square miles and a population of approximately 10,000. This slide shows the location of the elementary schools by the green arrows and the star represents the downtown area of Milford and the location of the Riverwalk. These slides show the physical layout of the elementary schools located in the city of Milford. In the first phase, we wanted to connect the three elementary schools with the downtown area of Milford and Milford's Riverwalk. Just some basic information about the Riverwalk. This project has taken over 20 years and is a walk along the Mississippian River and consists of almost two miles of walkable pavement, benches, and overlooks. This slide shows the eastern part of the Riverwalk beginning in a nature area called Goat Island. The Riverwalk then works its way into downtown Milford. In its heyday, Milford was a large shipbuilding city. The various amenities that have been constructed for pedestrians and bicyclists recently along the Riverwalk. These yellow projections are called life rings and are found along the Riverwalk in case someone gets into trouble in the water. Banner Elementary School, which is located near the eastern edge of the Riverwalk. The Riverwalk begins here at Silver Lake. The Riverwalk goes through the center of town. The city of Milford has various celebrations, and one of these celebrations is called the Bug and Bud Festival. The main street in the city of Milford is called Walnut Street, and Walnut Street gets very busy and we hope that people would either park their vehicles at the elementary schools and either walk into downtown or use their bicycles. The other activity that we are trying to pursue is to locate a bicycle path along Airport Road from the center of town to the Boys and Girls Club. In phase two, with the cooperation of Denrec, the city developed a pedestrian and bicycle plan for the city of Milford. the existing bike lanes on Marshall Street, the bike lanes on Elks Lodge Road, the existing bike lanes on Rehoboth Boulevard. We also looked at existing conditions including schools, the library, hospital, as well as existing population nodes and future population nodes. This, this slide shows the mapping of places of interest in the city of Milford. And this slide shows the existing and future population nodes for the city of Milford. The final analysis for the pedestrian and A major undertaking for non-motorized planning that was undertaken in northern Delaware was to attempt to find a suitable pathway to get from the city of Wilmington to the city of Newark, home to the Fighting Blue Hens of the University of Delaware. Whitman Reckwart and Associates was hired to undertake the study. The firm provides complete architectural engineering services to industry as well as academic and research institutions, primarily in the Middle Atlantic. Jeff Rigner, AICP, is Vice President of WRA and is manager of the firm's Wilmington office. His passion is transforming our communities by making smart transportation choices. Jeff is a professional engineer and a certified planner with 23 years of consulting experience, primarily for the public sector clients. He served as a workshop instructor for the National Complete Streets Coalition and is past chair of both the Institute of Transportation Engineers, Pedestrian and Bicycle Council, and the Newark, Delaware Bicycle Committee. Jeff holds degrees from the University of Delaware 
in the University of California, Berkeley. I'm going to present today on a very exciting initiative that's happening in the state of Delaware called the First Day Trail and Pathway Initiative. I'll give you some background on the program, uh, some specific challenges linking Newcastle County's two largest cities, Newark and Wilmington, the process that the team followed to overcome those challenges, and how we get from our study to what you see here, cutting ribbons on projects as soon as possible. The First Aid Trail and Pathway Initiative is a, an initiative of Governor Markell and the Delaware General Assembly that took place almost three years ago. Uh, we've had $20 million in funding for the program over the last two years, which is really unprecedented for the size of our state, which, for example, is about 2,000 square miles and has a population of a little over 900,000 people. It's the governor's goal to be the first state in trails in the country and to be the number one bicycle-friendly state. Uh, we're doing quite well. We're number five in the country right now and number one east of the Mississippi. And the two lead agencies for this are the Delaware Department of Transportation and the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control, working with a number of municipalities and other local partners. Now, the purpose is really to build non-motorized travel connections within communities, between communities, and to really form an uninterrupted network. The primary focus is on trails, but DelDOT is continually looking at ways to improve roads for walking and biking as well. Although this presentation won't talk further about on-road facilities, uh, we've had a lot of input from stakeholder and advisory groups that showed us that there are routes that folks are taking today and there are ways that we can improve them. And those routes today can be very challenging. As you can see from the map, Newark is the urban area to the bottom left. Wilmington is to the upper right. And this is a very densely developed area. The downtowns of Newark and Wilmington are only about 12 miles apart as the crow flies. But bike-friendly routes that are that short or nearly that short are really hard to come by. Moreover, the East Coast Greenway takes this route. And there is more or less a mandate under the East Coast Greenway to find a connection that's suitable for everyday travelers of all ages and abilities, many of whom really aren't comfortable riding in mixed traffic. Some of our challenges, as I mentioned, are the fact that we're traversing urban areas and entering suburbs. So the opportunities for new routes for trails are very limited. We also have significant environmental concerns. Much of the state is in the coastal plain, and in fact the photo that you see here is an actual example of an area that we're hoping to traverse with a trail. Now, on the flip side, being able to go through such natural areas really provides educational opportunities and, frankly, is really beautiful for recreational trips. In terms of technical process, we started out by doing a GIS exercise, looking at opportunities. So first, we examined where existing trails are and the extent to which we could use them. We looked at publicly owned land, which is shown primarily in green on the map you see here utility corridors, and any unused road or rail rights-of-way. As I mentioned, there are a number of different constraints. Uh, wetlands and floodplains constitute the natural resource issues that we dealt with. There are many, many developed areas in the corridor, and there are a number of major road crossings with which we were concerned. We also looked very closely at land use. Uh, as I mentioned, the downtowns are about 12 miles apart. Any trail route between the two, of course, is going to be a bit longer. So we aren't necessarily looking to serve a lot of people who will go end to end. Rather, there are many more opportunities to have local trips between homes and businesses, homes and stores, homes and schools, for example. We also looked at the directness of routes and grades and ADA accessibility. Yes, grades do matter in Delaware. Not all of the state is in, our, in the coastal plain. Our initial options were really varied. Uh, as you can see, we started with this kind of spaghetti map of different colors of potential routes, which is what you might expect as a result of a GIS exercise. So what we did to ground truth all of this is we visited every mile of the routes that are shown here. So we wanted to really understand and gauge the feasibility of each of these routes and their potential for implementation. And we really looked at three families of routes. These are the northern options. Uh, generally, in the colors, darker is harder to implement and lighter is easier to implement. On the north side, we had fairly limited land availability. A lot of the areas developed, a number of significant road crossings, and this is the area where grades were a significant concern. Uh, we're in the Piedmont region of Delaware, which has short, steeper hills that make ADA accessibility particularly challenging. 
Most of the routes that we developed on this and other maps are separate shared use paths, generally 10 feet wide with a hardened surface. But a few of them use low speed, low volume local streets to make critical connections. The central route is more in the coastal plain, so grade issues are less of an issue, but wetlands, floodplains, and other natural resources become a concern. In this area especially, we need to take advantage of existing crossings because we have existing interstate highways that we need to bridge, as well as the Christina River, which is the network of dark blue that you see on the right. The southern route has similar issues to the central. Although it's somewhat less direct, it follows an area with relatively less development so that there are more opportunities to provide connection. So how do we turn all of this into an implementable work program? Well, really, the Delaware way is to start with public input. So we had two public workshops for this program. There was really extensive advertisement for this, including social media and a lot of outreach by advocacy groups and local municipalities. We had about 200 participants combined between the two workshops, which is really remarkable for a planning study. And here's what we heard. The number one message was we had strong support to move the project forward just as quickly as we could to the point where there was even a petition received to get this thing moving as quickly as possible. A number of folks expressed preferences for individual trail segments and there was also, as I mentioned earlier, some information on interim on-road improvements that could be done to make connections between the two cities before the trail work could actually be completed. In terms of prioritization, we identified issues to build in each segment. And for each one, we developed just a, a fairly simple qualitative ranking based on relative ease of implementation, public support that we got from the public workshops and from advocacy groups, as well as connections to existing trails. So this map shows, in the end, the route that was selected. It's about 20 miles long between the two stars, Newark on the left and Wilmington on the right. And it's composed of a string of segments that are largely from the central alternatives map I mentioned earlier. It really focuses primarily on connecting existing trails, which are shown in green on the map. The first mile on the left in Newark is complete and is part of the Pomeroy and Hall trails. And roughly 40% of the trail on the right side, starting in Wilmington, is either built, which is shown in green, or in design, which is shown in orange. For example, the north-south segment that you see on the right side is the Newcastle Industrial Track Trail between Wilmington and Newcastle. This is a seven-mile trail that is going to connect the two cities with only two at-grade road crossings and is largely under development. Uh, there are trails also along routes 273 and 58 that extend west from that point. And critically, there is an existing bridge across I-95 along Route 58. So that means that there are really three main segments that need to move forward into planning. The first of those on the left side is along Route 72, which has an existing side path that needs some significant upgrades to meet current standards. The main east-west route is along the existing power line, roughly parallel to 95. And then there's a short section along Route 58 that includes the crossing of the Christina River. In terms of next steps, uh, starting primarily with the three that I just mentioned, We'll work closely with stakeholders to define the scopes of those projects and to estimate their costs so that ultimately funds can be programmed for design, for right-of-way acquisition, and for construction. Then those projects move forward directly into design and ultimately are built. And one of the goals of the initiative is to track progress so that we can really... William Switek, AICP, is a senior planner with the Wilmington Area Planning Council, or WILMAPCO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Wilmington, Delaware region. He leads the agency's environmental and social justice planning efforts. Bill has completed several pedestrian analyses and plans from the region to the neighborhood level. His work combines technical analysis with field work and community involvement. Bill holds a master's degree in geography and serves as the current president of APA Delaware. Bill's talk today will be on WOMAPCO's well, top pedestrian priority segments. Well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, this is a presentation on the top priority pedestrian segments analysis that WOMAPCO well, uses to prioritize uh, pedestrian investments. As many listeners on the call will no doubt understand, transportation is chronically 
underfunded in the United States and particularly non-motorized uh, transportation. So we really, as a, a MPO, developed a way to uh, try to prioritize what limited funding goes to non-motorized transportation through this uh, process. This is an outline of my presentation this afternoon. I'm going to go over an introduction to this work, how we developed the pedestrian priority uh, criterion that we'll be reviewing, a study that we did in 2012 called the Top Priority Segment uh, Analysis, and then we're going to jump into some field surveys uh, of what's on the ground in those top priority areas. We'll also take a look at the work to date uh, with implementing this project. This is a map that shows the Wilmapco region. As you can see, it's two counties. We have Newcastle County, which is the northernmost of Delaware's three counties, and Cecil County, which is the northeasternmost of Maryland's counties. The two counties are roughly the same size and geographic area, but Newcastle County is a bit larger, as you can see from that graphic on the right. Um, it's a largely suburban county with one um, mid-sized city in Wilmington. Cecil County is largely rural. Uh, with a handful of small towns. Well, MAPCO is the metropolitan planning organization for this region. Uh, as the MPO, we develop a long-range transportation plan. That current plan goes out to the year 2040. And we also complete um, regional and local plans to, to really support the vision and implementation of that long-range plan. And this work is, is part of, uh, of that process. In the region, uh, we struggle with uh, a tremendous amount of suburban sprawl, a lot of Euclidean zoning that developed over the past um, century that's led to disconnected land uses, commercial in one place, um, housing in another, and also heavy and rising uh, vehicle travel uh, that's related to this, this sprawl. And this has a tremendous impact on non-motorized funding and also travel. It really undermines non-motorized uh, travel in the region and you know a lot of the money that we do have goes into highway investment and not uh, pedestrian and, and bike facilities. So over the long term we would like to check and reverse that sprawling development pattern, um, investing in existing places and identifying some dedicated non-motorized funding pools and not relying on road projects to, to have pedestrian uh, improvements. Over the short term, however, this present work really looks to better prioritize, again, that limited funding that we do have and identifying immediate and cost-effective improvements to the system. Now, well, MAPCO has taken uh, a look at pedestrian prioritization for about two decades now. Uh, this is an uh, analysis that was done back in 1996 with our first long-range plan. And we identified pedestrian priority areas, uh, which, as you can see in the, the legend here, were places within a municipality, within one mile of a school, within a quarter mile of a, a bus stop. Uh, but the issue with this was about half of the region uh, was identified as a priority area. So we, over the past decade, tried to add some more nuance into this work, really trying to identify where the pedestrian generators were and where should infrastructure receive you know, more priority within those, uh, within those balloons that were shown on that previous map. Our method was to use the road network itself as a base in a GIS analysis. Uh, we scored segments of that road network based on specific criteria that I'll uh, go over in a second. But just to illustrate this methodology a bit, here's a map showing the uh, centerline files, the road files that we have for both counties. Uh, and they're in gray here. And if we zoom into this one uh, town along the Delaware River, this is uh, Delaware City, each of these colored uh, lines represents a segment in that road file. And there are tens of thousands of these segments that make up the road file in the Wamapco region. Each of these colored lines received a score uh, for its ability to generate pedestrian activity and as a place where we should invest our limited non-motorized uh, dollars. So it's a very, very fine-grained uh, analysis, much more fine-grained than we've done in the past. Our criterion for the study were developed through an established committee that we have at WilmapGo, our non-motorized transportation working group. 
And this is a committee that's made up of representatives from the DOTs, from the county, from the city, and also public advocates for pedestrian and, and bicycle travel. In our index, we gave points to those segments, those little colored lines, within a municipality, within a school, within a quarter mile of a transit stop, just as we had done in 1996, but added to that in this analysis, commercially zoned property, community centers, libraries, parks. We also added uh, points for those segments that were within dense traffic analysis zones. Uh, TAZs are about the size of a census track or a census block group for those familiar with the census. And we basically found those TAZs that were home to a lot of population and employment to award those points. Additionally, we gave points to segments that were within uh, areas that were home to a lot of low income and minority populations, also seniors, disabled, and zero car household populations. In addition, points were awarded to those segments within a half mile of an existing or planned greenway. The East Coast Greenway, for example, is a planned route that runs from Maine to Florida, and it goes right through the Wamapco region. So those segments that were nearby that feature, as well as some of its spurs, received a point in our system. In addition, we gave a point to those segments that were within our hometown overlay zones, which are basically unincorporated places in, in Newcastle County that um, have a solid plan that are established places uh, and so forth. We gave even more points to those segments that were um, that had a safety issue with them. Um, we, in Newcastle County where we have some good crash data, we gave between one to four points for those segments that uh, fell along roadways with either a high pedestrian crash rate or high raw numbers of pedestrian crashes. In Cecil County, where we did not have those data, we awarded points to segments that were identified by the DOT as in need of pedestrian uh, facilities. I'll just make a note that those segments of road that were on expressways where pedestrian travel is prohibitive automatically received a score of zero in our system. So I'm going to illustrate this a bit with the maps again. Uh, this is a map that shows uh, those areas within one mile of a school. And if we kind of zoom into the western part of our region, this is the towns of Port Deposit and uh, Perryville, you can see there's about seven schools in this area. And then the colored um, balloon around each school represents that one mile buffer. And basically each of those gray lines the road network gets a point um, in the system. If we take a look at a specific segment, this is an uh, area of commercial highway between Wilmington and Newark. Uh, you can see this, this area did very well in our system, receiving points in most of the categories, and then three points in the safety category. So it's a dangerous stretch of roadway for pedestrians in the region. Uh, this is a, a commercial corridor that's really not designed for pedestrians in mind, but it's also one of our busiest um, transit corridors in the region. A lot of public bus um, activity there. So this is the resulting map, if we take everything together, uh, that shows our, our prioritized pedestrian network in the Wamapco region. I will note that we do have two separate scoring systems for Newcastle County and Cecil County, really just based on data availability. And this doesn't concern us too much as the funding streams are different, as these are two different states. Uh, but as you can see, looking at this map, the key cities for each of the, the counties receive the highest number of, of high-scoring segments. So Wilmington in, in Newcastle County, and then Elkton, which is the principal town in, in Cecil County, had the most um, segments of, uh, of high pedestrian uh, generation capacity. So we've used this priority tool for the last decade or so as a planning tool in the Wamapka region. Um, it's been used to select uh, projects when we've been asked where should you know, some funding go for countdown signals, et cetera. We've also used it to prioritize neighborhood infrastructure improvements as part of a Safe Routes to School program in Wilmington that you can see from the, the picture there on the, the bottom right. And we've used it in our environmental justice studies where we've done walkability surveys to prioritize the recommendations that came out of them. But again, we wanted to try to add some even more nuance into this work. Um, and in 2012, we did a study that, that tried to take this further. 
we took a look at the top priority segments regionally, so those segments that had the highest the highest scores, and actually went out into the field and uh, assessed the pedestrian environment there, and then made some recommendations for um, for pedestrian upgrades. And at WMAPCA, we look at this as our priorities for uh, pedestrian infrastructure when that funding comes through. I'll just note that this study is available on our website at that link um, on the screen. So this is a map that shows our top priority pedestrian segments. Um, in Cecil County, all of those were found in the town of Elkton. In Newcastle County, the majority of them were found in the city of Wilmington, uh, as we would expect. Now for each of these areas, again, we assessed the, the number of pedestrian crashes. We looked at the uh, and made recommendations for different projects within there. They even developed a cost estimate for those uh, projects. So I'm going to run through a few of these just to give you a sample of, of some of the field work that was done. So for each of these segments, we took a look at an air photo uh, to illustrate the, the work that we did in the field. Uh, these are two roadways in northeastern uh, part of Wilmington. And each of the dots represents an area where the intersection could be upgraded for pedestrians. And each of the lines represents an area of sidewalk that needs replacement. Uh, additionally, the crosses on this map represent places where there's been a pedestrian crash over the past few years. So we just take a look at one um, specific spot. This is a, a traffic circle. And you can see it's a, a home to a, a bus stop here, but really no good pedestrian infrastructure to, to safely get those transit patrons to the surrounding uses. So that was a recommendation here. So marking those crosswalks, adding ADA um, compliant curb ramps, and also pedestrian signals to ease the movement of the transit patrons from the surrounding places to that, that bus stop. This is another segment closer into the downtown along the same streets and um, you can see that the, the sidewalk on the bottom uh, area gets a little bit choppier as you're heading into the closer to the city center. Um, so there were a number of recommendations to replace sidewalk in this area uh, and we also found another tough intersection here, a lot of pedestrian activity and another bus stop uh, that could use some improvements at its intersection. This is another part of Wilmington. Uh, the top segment here is uh, 4th Street, uh, which is actually the most dangerous segment of roadway for pedestrians in our, um, in our state, in Delaware. About a quarter of all crashes in the state occur on 4th Street. And we found a number of recommendations um, to, to improve pedestrian activity here. This was an interstate um, off-ramp here on the, the top picture on the right. Uh, and you can see that there really aren't any pedestrian amenities out there. Um, and we made a number of recommendations in this study and happy to report that in the past year, this intersection has received some attention uh, for pedestrian upgrades. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done, though, to make this corridor safer for pedestrians. Moving to our other county, this is a segment of road on SR 213, which is a north-south road leading um, into Elkton from the south. And you can see from this picture here that it's really not a welcoming corridor uh, for pedestrians. Uh, this walker kind of gets lost in the in the commercial uses and, and um, auto-dominant um, landscape here. And so we made some recommendations to address the, the sloping sidewalk there. And then as you get down to this intersection with US 40, which is probably the busiest in that county, uh, again, very unwelcoming for uh, pedestrians. We made a number of recommendations to, uh, to try to improve that. But most of the, the places did have some things that, um, that we were pretty impressed with when we went out into the field. Uh, this is a uh, segment of road in, in downtown Elkton, and we were really hard-pressed to find recommended improvements here. It was just such a beautiful streetscape um, that was put in over the past few years. So funding always comes up as a, um, as a question for how to complete these projects. Uh, we do have complete streets policies both in Maryland and Delaware. And so road projects that come through for regular maintenance um, can complete many of the sidewalk improvements and intersection improvements that we found. Local officials can also be tapped to uh, fund these projects. They receive pots of, of funding that can, uh, that can complete small projects. The Transportation Alternatives Program, which came out of the new 
MAP 21 transportation legislation um, is also an avenue to complete many of the projects that, that we found and to really focus our work in those pedestrian uh, corridors. Um, well, MAPCO uses the pedestrian uh, criteria that we went over in this in this presentation as the basis for how we score uh, TAP projects when they come in. So theoretically, if a project is within one of our key corridors, it will receive the highest score. The Safe Routes to School program is another federal program that uh, is a, an avenue for funding these projects. Um, in that 2012 study, we took a look at uh, the schools that were nearby the, the top corridors, and there were dozens of schools in those, in those areas that could be approached, and the Safe Routes to School program could be started, which does provide infrastructure funding uh, to complete sidewalk and, and non-motorized projects. So if anyone has any questions and you're not able to, to get to, and we're not able to get to them at the end, do feel free to give me a call or, or send me an email. And again, I'm going to put up the, the website. Anne Murray will provide some insight into a more localized effort. Anne Murray Townsend, AICP, is the Director of Planning and Community Development for the City of Dover. In this capacity, she manages the Planning and Inspections Department and the Parks and Recreation Department. Prior to this position, Anne Marie worked in various planning positions with the State of Delaware. Anne Marie is a member of the American Planning Association, the Institute of Certified Planners, and the Delaware Recreation and Parks Society. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Towson University and a Master's of Public Administration from the University of Delaware. In her professional capacity, Anne Marie has made incorporating help into community design and recreation programming a priority. Anne Marie is an active volunteer with the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and Holy Cross Religious Education. She lives with her husband and two sons in downtown Dover. I'm going to be talking this afternoon about a school planning case study where we worked very hard to implement some changes to the site plan so that we could make sure that it helped to promote bicycle and pedestrian access. First, let me give you the geographic context. The project that we're looking at is the building of a new Dover High School. And it's the, the one high school that we have in the city. It serves a, a very wide population. And if you look at the top of the screen, you can see a star where it shows where the current high school is. And you can tell that it's in a very densely populated area developed all around it. If you look down at the middle left of the screen, you can see where the new high school is. The current high school sits on about 44 acres. The new high school sits on 106 acres. And again, that's related to the needs for the sports fields. If you look at the location of the new high school, you can see that it's, it's really at the very edge of town, that there's a little bit on the east, north, and south of it, but west of it is, is pretty much farmland. In the context of our comprehensive plan, you can see that the school site is residential, and it's zoned residentially, and it was planned for medium density residential development. And you can also see just to the north and just to the south that it, there is permanently preserved agricultural land in the general area and also some of the 10-year agricultural districts. So it, it's really in an area that is transitioning from the urban area to a, a much more rural area. Again, if you look more closely at the site, the high school site is the kind of sawtooth cut piece. It has two points on the south ends. You can see that there is residential development directly south of it. There's residential development and commercial development to the east, and then there's also residential development to the north. So there are a number of residential communities that are surrounding the high school. This slide shows the the site plan layout. So you can see that the building is on the west side of the site and then the, the ball fields are on the east side of the site. You can also see that there are a number of out parcels that are existing residences that kind of cut into the, the school site. So there are a number of, of challenges in, in developing this site. One, the site is approximately a half mile from what you see is the east entrance of the site to the west entrance of the site. So it's a very wide site. 
there were a number of things that we looked at in the planning. First, you can see on the top left, there's a signal that is designed and planned at the west entrance. Immediately west of the school property, there is a apartment complex that is getting ready to go under construction within the next year, and that was into the planning process before the high school. So the idea here is that they will share an entrance that will be a public street, and it will be signalized. If you look along the road on the east side of the site, you can see where it's circled that there's a signal that was proposed, but the warrants were not met. So the school wanted to see a signal in that location, but it did not meet the warrants through the Department of Transportation's um, warrant analysis, so a signal is not allowed in that location. If you look at the south west end of the site, you can see a substreet that connects to the subdivision to the south. Both of the subdivisions to the south were built with substreets to the north, again, anticipating that this was going to be a medium density residential development when it did develop, and obviously it's a school. So what you see on the, the west side of the site is actually a substreet and the connection from the school site, the public road that is going along the west entrance of the school site to the subdivision to the south. It's also anticipated that in the future there would be a road that would continue straight and go along the, the residential development to the south and, and connect to the, the east-west road to the south. And then if you look over to the east side of the screen, you can see where the stub street in the neighboring development is being utilized as a bicycle and pedestrian access point. So what you see there is a tree-lined multi-use path that comes in from that development and, and goes across the site, ultimately leading to the school building. So there are a number of on-site amenities that were incorporated in the plan from the beginning. One, there's a multi-use path along the frontage that wraps around the residential out parcels. It, initially, it actually was not going to wrap around the residential out parcels. It was really through the efforts of the Department of Transportation that this accommodation was made. There are 100 bicycle parking spaces that are provided throughout the site and there are sidewalks into the site from the adjoining roadways, both from the new road that's being built along the west side of the site and from the, the east entrance location. There are a number of challenges in, in working to plan this site. One is the issue of crossing Route 8. Route 8 is the city's major east-west corridor, one of the county's major east-west corridors into Dover. It brings people from places like Washington, D.C. and Baltimore and places over the Bay Bridge. So it gets a lot of traffic. It's a, it's a high-speed roadway where the speed limit is 50 miles per hour, and you can imagine the speeds tend to be a little higher than that. As I previously mentioned, there was a signal approved on the west side of the site, but there was not sufficient volume of traffic to warrant a signal on the east side of the site. As it relates to pedestrian access to the school from along the Route 8 corridor, there are regulations both at the, at the state and the city level that required a frontage sidewalk along the entire frontage of the site. However, there are gaps in the sidewalk network as you approach the site from, most importantly, the east. So the question became, how do you provide safe pedestrian and bicycle access when there are critical gaps in the sidewalk network? So why is pedestrian access important anyway? One, and first and foremost, is safety. If you don't provide safe pedestrian access, some students will walk to the school and cross the street anyway. So it's really important to provide that from a safety perspective. The second is cost. If you don't provide safe pedestrian access, the taxpayers need to pay to bus the students from across the street to the school, which, which clearly over the long term is not efficient use of, of the taxpayers' dollars. And the third is health. If we don't build communities that support physical activities, we just continue to perpetuate the inactivity and obesity epidemic that we have in the country 
So really developing healthy habits such as walking is really important at this critical age. The city reached out to the Dover Kent County Metropolitan Planning Organization and the MPO performed a pedestrian study in the area around the school to identify the sidewalk gaps in, in what would be considered the walk zone. They identified a number of critical gaps in the, the sidewalk network. The city and the state worked together with legislators, the state's Office of Management and, and Budget, and the Department of Transportation to secure funds and construct sidewalks to fill this critical gap on the north side of Route 8. And that was really a, a big undertaking because this was not, prior to the, the planning of the school, was not on anybody's radar screen as an area for a capital improvement in the state's capital transportation plan. But we were able to get it done and the project is currently underway. We're hoping that the sidewalks are in place by summer 2014 school is scheduled for opening in August of 2014. So again, this is, this is really an important piece. This is the area-wide map that, that was part of the pedestrian study with the high school. And where you see the pink lines, those are gaps in the sidewalk network. Where you see the blue lines, those are existing sidewalks or multimodal paths along the roadway. You can see that there are a number of, of gaps. We identified what we believe to be the most critical gaps to address first. And if you look at the, the darker pink line on this, the sidewalks at the, the north side of Route 8, without these sidewalks, there would really be no safe way for the, the students that live on the north side of Route 8 to access the school other than by vehicle. There's also a critical sidewalk gap on the south side of Route 8, but that's also a relatively undeveloped area. So really the north side was the most critical of the gaps. This is just a photo of, of where the gaps exist. And you can see we have a sidewalk coming out of a development that just simply ends. You can see in these pictures you have houses that don't have sidewalks in front of them. Another example of where you've got a, a subdivision where there are interior sidewalks, but it ends when it gets to Route 8. And this is a, a location of where the east entrance of the school is going to be located. So ultimately, um, and I'll talk a, a little bit in a minute about how we're going to safely get students across the street. So what were the results? What have we achieved at this point? As I mentioned, a full signal was not warranted at the east entrance. So we worked with the Department of Transportation and looked at the numbers for pedestrian volumes and they were able to justify doing a hawk signal at the east entrance. The hawk signal is a pedestrian activated signal that is not activate, activated by vehicles on the road but a pedestrian has to press a button, it blinks and then it goes to a static red and then it ch changes to a blinking red as the pedestrian finishes crossing the street. So this is something that is Simply to get pedestrians across the street, it is not meant to stop vehicles other than for pedestrian crossings. The sidewalks on the north side of Route 8, I talked about that significantly already. We had a number of key state legislators and, and state officials that made sure that these sidewalks got in place. And this was through their understanding that the long-term cost to the state was much higher if we didn't find a way to fund this capital project. So now the school is nearing completion. These are a couple of aerial photos. You can see, again, that kind of sawtooth edge to the school. The, the big round area is the stadium and track under construction. And you can see the, the school up toward the roadway. And again, this is a, another picture of the school. There's still more work to do. And, and I think there's going to be more work to do for a while. What you can see here in the, the bolder pink line is the south side of Route 8 and the sidewalks that will still be needed there, and then a road called Mifflin Road that connects down to the south, to the, the next east-west road. But that also connects to much more residential development, which is on the east side of it. And those students will now not be in the walk zone because they cannot provide a safe path of travel. So ultimately, we really need to look at building sidewalks on both sides of Mifflin Road 
so that we can really draw more people to the school by foot. Part of the challenge with this is going to be this is a very old road. It has open drainage and, and the cost of sidewalks will be extensive because the drainage improvements associated with them will be significant. This shows where there are some more additional sidewalks needed. This is a road to the north of, of Route 8 and it shows there are significant gaps in the in the sidewalk system there. This fortunately is in the capital transportation plan to begin the planning. So hopefully we'll be looking in, in the not too distant future at having sidewalks on this stretch of roadway. There's actually also a city park that connects some of these residential developments that if we put a path through the park it would also help to make more students able to walk to school. So that is something that we're going to be looking at that I'm sure anybody who's planned a multi-use path through a park that connects developments that were not previously connected knows that can sometimes be controversial and take a long time. So what are our lessons learned? Issues of bicycle and pedestrian access need to be part of the site selection process. This was a site that was in the growth zone. It met the acreage needs of the district, but there was no real discussion at the front end of how students would get to school other than by bus or car. Again, the whole idea of the bicycle and pedestrian improvements and other necessary infrastructure improvements that are part of tying the school into the community need to be part of the planning process from the beginning. And this is something that we really struggled with with this project throughout, this idea that you can plan for the school site, but if you can't plan to get people to the school site by tying the site into the community properly, you're setting yourself up for problems. This is a big one for us, that when building schools, school districts are developers and need to be held to the same standards. You know, this is a 100-acre site. It's at a very critical location in terms of the city's transportation and the state's transportation. So, the idea that they are developers and they need to help solve the problems that are created from a traffic standpoint when they site a school at that location, you know, that needs to be part of the equation and, and that's been one of the challenges we've really faced with this. Perhaps policy changes are needed at the state level. You know, there's a capital funding formula that recognizes the number of students and gives based on the number of students, number of square feet and all of those things how much the state is willing to support. But the funding formula doesn't really address the issue of the off-site improvements and the tying the school into the community. And perhaps we need to look from a policy perspective at the state level at having minimum standards for bicycle and pedestrian access to schools, whether it's an elementary school, middle school, or a high school. Because again, this is a, a very specific example of Dover, but these issues are repeated over and over again every time there's a school project in the state of Delaware. Now, I think we learned a lot along the way moving forward. Rich Better, AICP and PE, is the executive director of the Dover Kent County Metropolitan Planning Organization. His primary responsibilities includes coordinating transportation planning efforts among the state and local agencies within Kent County which includes the allocation of resources, interagency coordination, and completion of transportation planning studies. Prior to coming to the MPO, Rich worked for several local consulting firms assisting the Department of Transportation with transportation engineering and planning studies. He began his career working for the Delaware Department of Transportation, where he managed regional, corridor, and municipal transportation planning studies. Rich has a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering from the University of Delaware. He's a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and is registered as a professional engineer in the state of Delaware. Rich will discuss the planning and implementation for the beginnings of the Capital City Trail Network. Uh, I'd like to talk about the Dover Kent County MPO Bicycle Plan, which was uh, formulated several years ago. This is kind of a synopsis of the history, how the plan came to be, uh, and just a discussion, I guess, on some of the recommendations that actually came out of the bike plan. To start, to give a profile of Kent County, Delaware, it's, it's relatively low density, population approximately 160 
5,000. Predominantly rural, about 85 percent. There's 20 municipalities within the county. Uh, they range from under 100 population to the capital of Dover, which is approximately 40,000 population. There's one MPO that's located in the county. It, it encompasses the entire uh, entire county. Just a, a brief history, the Dover-Kent County MPO developed a bicycle plan in uh, November of 2000 is when the plan was actually initiated. And this was a plan for the entire county. Uh, this was the first time this has actually been done on a county-wide level. It took approximately two years uh, to develop the plan. Uh, there was uh, numerous recommendations that actually came out of the plan in terms of engineering recommendations. There was 18 on-road specific recommendations or improvements that were developed and seven off-road trails uh, that were recommended. And then we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. So we had a plan. We went through a lot of public involvement. This is where we did not want the plan to end up, obviously, would be on the, uh, the shelf, uh, never to be seen again. So fortunately, I guess in, in Delaware, we were very fortunate to kind of on the heels, I guess, of the, of the uh, MPO bicycle plan, uh, the first state trails and pathways plan came out uh, following it, it, literally a month later in October uh, 2011. This had top level support from the governor, from the state legislature on down. There was an agreement, a formulation that was developed between the Department of Transportation and the Department of Natural Resources, which essentially guided this, uh, this first state trails and pathways program in terms of design, you know, who's going to maintain these trails, who's going to construct them, and most importantly, who's going to pay for them. There was uh, $13 million that was set up for projects throughout the state, bike and pedestrian type projects. So this was actually a high level priority from the state. As I mentioned, we'll focus on the trail network that was established or trying to be established in the Dover area. This was the capital, as I mentioned, of Kent County. This is kind of a bird's eye view of the county. The blue lines represent the existing trails. There's several. They essentially connect parks. Uh, there's a few in the downtown core area. Uh, the red lines represent proposed trails. These are trails that actually were developed or formulated out of the MPO bicycle plan. I'm going to focus on two of these trails today. One is the Capital City Trail, which is kind of located at the top of the, of the map. Uh, it's a red line at the top in the downtown area. And then the very bottom line, the bottom red line, is uh, Route 10. We'll focus on those two trails. So as I mentioned, the Capital City Trail is an important trail that's been around for a long time. It was actually identified in 1997 by the city of Dover uh, in their original bike plan. It was identified again as part of the Department of Natural Resources, their Greenway plan here in 1999. And again, it's, it was the number one priority in the MPO bicycle plan. This is just a picture of the beginning of the trail. This is the part that's actually already been done uh, in one of the park systems. So as I mentioned, the Capital City Trail has a long history. The red line actually represents the original design for this trail. It goes right down the middle of uh, the Capitol. Actually, the state capital is located towards the center of this, uh, this drawing here. It's on the west side of the St. Jones River. And I guess associated with that, there's a lot of, of issues. Uh, there's private right-of-way. There's some environmental concerns, steep slopes, uh, wetlands. There's a former sewer treatment plant that's located there. And then you know, how do we actually cross Route 13, which is kind of shown. Uh, north to south here. Route 13 is a traditional commercial corridor, high speed, high volume, a lot of trucks. So it's, it's very, it would be very difficult from a bike and pedestrian standpoint to, to cross. And obviously all these issues lead to additional cost. So what was developed as a result of the bicycle plan for this Capital City Trail was actually to move the alignment and utilize existing infrastructure where we could. There's, just, there's very little new trail that's proposed here. Just essentially right in front of the State Capitol building is the only new trail being suggested or being implemented. And as you can see, the benefits of this all on uh, existing right away. Um, we're looking to widen the existing sidewalk and just put in pieces where it needs to be, where, where there's just infill. Uh, there's a signalized crossing, basically essentially where that Route 13 number is at the bottom of the, uh, the map. This leads to increased uh, aesthetics and kind of a gateway into the state capitol complex within the, uh, within the city, and of course a lower cost associated with that. These are just some renderings, and actually this piece has been very recently constructed, been built, uh, but these are renderings at the top. This would be the approach of the Capital City Trail. It's just a five-foot sidewalk and, and limited aesthetics. Uh, the proposed is, is located at the bottom. It's an artist's rendering, but that's essentially what it looks like today with pedestrian scale lighting, landscaping, wider pavement, etc. This is on Route 13. This is, uh, again, a rendering, but this, again, this piece has recently been constructed. So it's the same concept to actually widen the sidewalk, beautify the area, and this is a pretty heavily used um, area you know, along this existing commercial uh, route. 
This is the area directly in front of Legislative Hall, the state capitol. It's pretty, uh, pretty sparse, pretty bare, as it was you know, existing as of a year ago. And what's proposed here is the uh, aesthetic treatment, flowers, the beautification. It leads to a nice, you know, a nice trail, actually. It, it, there's low speeds in front of this uh, particular facility, so it makes for a nice trail connection, a nice entry into the state capitol. This is just a picture that shows the partnerships that made this happen. The, the DOT is represented, natural resources is, is represented, the city, the MPO, and, and a private citizen, a, a bike advocate off to the right. So this was obviously at the groundbreaking. Um, in terms of the schedule, in terms of DOT timing, this is a, a very fast project, actually, which is good. We needed to see some success on the ground. Um, the red piece has been recently constructed at the end of last year. The yellow and the orange, our final design has occurred, and they're set to be constructed this spring. The other project that came out of the, the uh, MPO bicycle plan was Route 10 in terms of bicycle and pedestrian improvements. Route 10, as I referenced before, is, a, is a, a, another high speed, uh, high volume, four lane divided highway. It's 50 miles an hour. There's shoulders. Um, and again, this route has been a priority for a number of years from natural resources, uh, DELDOT, the, the Kent County, and then and the MPO as well. This map shows exactly what the limits of this particular project are. As you can see, off to the right is Dover Air Force Base, which is a, a very significant facility. It's 3,000 acres and approximately 10 to 15,000 people that actually work there. So they actually generate some bicycle and pedestrian traffic on Route 10 in that area. Route 10 is a pretty typical suburban land use. There's some commercials you can see in the middle. There's a, a, a strip shopping center. There's some high density residential off to the right. The purpose of this project was to try to connect the high density residential to the strip shopping center and actually look to the west in terms of bicycle and pedestrian improvements. There is uh, the trail on the north side. It's adjacent to the Route 1. It's called the Isaacs Branch Trail. Uh, that's a county maintained facility and that's an important link actually to the Capital City Trail. So there's a lot of different things that are actually going on in terms of multimodal um, transportation in this particular area. There's just some pictures of the Isaacs Branch Trail. It's a pretty scenic trail. It's good for recreation. It's, it's designated as a greenway trail, and it does provide some transportation benefits actually from Route 10 from the air base area into the capital city itself. Unfortunately, it ends. As you can see here, it ends. It just terminates at Route 10. There's, uh, there's really no designated trail, even though there is a sign there, but the trail itself or, or whatever it's supposed to be is actually overgrown. Um, there's no real facility that's actually on Route 10. Route 10 is designated as a regional bicycle route. We did some bicycle counts several years ago. There's not a lot of bike activity on Route 10 at this point. There is pretty significant pedestrian activity, though, despite the fact that there's no sidewalks. It's just an existing arterial, essentially, with, with high speed and uh, with shoulders. So there's about four times more pedestrians and bicyclists on Route 10. Some examples of some individuals that are walking from the shopping center. It's about a third of a mile to the high density residential. So they kind of use the shoulder, they have to. There's another one. This is obviously not the safest situation in the world. Somebody that's walking around a curve in the right turn lane. This is not photoshopped. There's a baby stroller and then uh, there's a biker at the same exact time literally hanging into the, into the travel lane. So this is what we're trying to improve and alleviate so we don't have these conflicts. Route 10 also has a situation, this is looking westbound, away from the Dover Air Force Base. As you can see, this is not conducive for bike or pedestrian travel whatsoever. Uh, there's no shoulders, it's uphill, it's high speed, you're talking 55 miles an hour at least. Um, this shows here what we're talking about. You only have about a foot to a foot and a half of width, so obviously you can't walk, or if you do bike, you're going to be actually in the travel lane itself. This is uh, Route 10 across the bridge. The bridge has always been the conflict point here. So this is actually eastbound, away from a shopping center, kind of towards the Dover Air Force Base. This shows the wide shoulders on the right side. You have 10, 10 feet, uh, but it's high speed, and we're trying to kind of eliminate potential conflicts and improve this as a, you know, as a, as a bicycle route. This is a rendering of the proposed improvements. There's a barrier that's been added onto the shoulder itself. So essentially, there would be a six to ten foot path, kind of utilizing this, the existing shoulder, just delineating that with a barrier for improved safety. Um, this is another artist rendering here. You can see the guardrail has been extended out. Uh, there's a new hot mix path, a fence, and uh, just kind of facilitates that movement so people don't actually have to walk into the, the shoulder and potentially the travel lane. 
Um, route 10 in terms of a schedule, the phase one, which I just referenced, the design is complete. Construction is anticipated to begin this year uh, when the new fiscal year starts. So again, these are pretty rapid with projects trying to get on the ground as, as soon as possible uh, because they were identified as high priority projects. There's a phase two, which would extend the project about three miles to the west, all along Route 10 towards the town of Camden. It will be a planning study that will also be initiated this year, and that has design funding. Are we good? Hey folks, this is Jim Galvin. Uh, we're live now. Um, first, I want to apologize for our technical difficulties. Um, I think we've thank you for sticking around with us to the end here. Um, Fortunately, we got them straightened out. The, uh, so we've learned a little bit about bicycle and pedestrian planning efforts in Delaware. Uh, I want to thank all the presenters for providing their insights this afternoon. Um, we've actually gathered four of them together this afternoon in, in, in this room at the Kent County Administrative Complex. Uh, we, and we have, uh, that's Gary, Bill, and Marie and Rich, and we have Jeff on the phone. Um, we want to start answering some of the questions that we've seen come up on the chat box. We've got a nice summary of them here, uh, thanks to Christine. Um, first, one I'd like to ask Gary is, uh, uh, did the school districts participate, the school, schools or the school districts participate in the planning efforts that were happening for the bike plan, for the bike plan for Milford? Uh, yes, they did. They, they were a uh, uh, I'll say a participant, and we had discussions with the uh, superintendent regarding our proposals. Um, again, connecting the uh, elementary schools with with the river walk. Uh, they they weren't a financial contributor, but they were uh, certainly a participant. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, the the proposed um, bicycle and pedestrian uh, walkways or, or bike trails to, to the river walk, uh, we, we try to have like a three-step approach. Uh, the first step was to, to, to inventory the uh, sidewalks to make sure that they were, were walkable. Uh, the second thing that the, the city tried to do was to uh, have signage along uh, those streets which designated as a pedestrian and a bicycle route from the elementary schools. Uh, to the river walk, and the third thing that we tried to do was to actually uh, mark the street and, and get people to use their bicycles. Thanks, Gary. Um, Jeff, I actually, actually have a question for you here that uh, I'm not really familiar with. It says the TAP projects require a SAM registration, SAM, with the federal government as a first step, correct? Hello, Jeff. I'm afraid I'm not familiar with that term. Uh, Sorry. Uh, neither, neither am I, so I, I think we're both kind of at a loss here. Um, we do have something for Anne Marie. Uh, um, the first is a comment about why you'd want to put a school where that is. Uh, the next was um, the, 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 school, the school, the high school is offering 100 bike spaces compared to how many car spaces? Any idea how many were required? Um, the number of car spaces, I believe, was somewhere between 400 and 800. I can't remember. It, it was a lot. Um, they ended up get, getting a waiver. I can't remember off the top of my head. So yes, it, it, we did build certainly more for cars than for bikes. Um, as to the location, um, the, the school district picked the location. They had a number of sites that they were looking at that met their need. And unfortunately, this was really the only one that was in the growth area. And, and I think part of that is that, that driver of needing 100 acres due to the field needs, that they're finding 100 acres on the market in the growth area where your population is was, was a bit of a challenge. Uh, there's another question here for you that I, I find really interesting. I think Rich and Ann Marie might want to have an input into this. It says hawk signals are not usually installed on roads with speed limits above 45 miles an hour. You mentioned the operating speeds are above 50. Um, what analysis was done to ensure safe operation? 
think this particular signal is actually in a, a 40. It's right at the transition. Uh, so that's, you know, we worked with DALDOT on that particular site. Um, so that's, you know, that's, I think we're fortunate that it's at, actually at that transition uh, to a 40, you know, 40 mile an hour zone. Um, and I'll just make a note too, this is Bill talking, we have a Hawk signal in the city of Newark and there was a bit of a transition uh, for the motorists to, to get to used to what um, those signals mean and the flashes and so forth. So you might expect some um, uptick in crashes when that first comes in. Well, and just regarding the, the Hawk system, Bill mentioned that the one in Newark, this will only be the, the state of Delaware's second Hawk signal. So we're, we've already had the discussions about making sure we have the electronic messaging system out there to warn people about it and making sure that all of the added signage that has happened in Newark since the signal initially went into place happens at the very beginning. We also believe that we're going to have a much higher volume of pedestrian traffic at this Hawk signal, which should help to condition the drivers a little better, but you know, it, it is going to be a challenge at first, no doubt. Um, we have a, a, an explanation on the SAM program, Jeff. Um, it, it's a, SAM is a federal government contracting registry. Um, so, again, that doesn't catch me. Does that make sense to you? Well, we're actually, the, the trail program in Delaware is funded by uh, really a number of different sources. Uh, the two federal funding sources, one is TAP, uh, the Transportation Alternatives Program, formerly Transportation Enhancements. Uh, that's used for various segments. And uh, Delaware is actually currently using uh, CMAC, Congestion Management and Air Quality Funding, for two of the principal segments of the industrial track trail that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so those are areas that are expected to provide some relief for, for congestion and uh, improvements to air quality and other environmental factors. So follow here on that uh, for your segment, Jeff. It appears that the Newark Wilmington Trail must cross the Christina River twice. Uh, if so, how many are, are any new bridges needed, and what are the tra tractors and generators of Newcastle that justify the route through it? Well, that's a fantastic question. Uh, the our routing was really one of opportunity. Uh, Continuous routes along the north side of the Christina River, which would avoid those two crossings, really just didn't exist. Those were some of the very earliest uh, suburbs of Wilmington, very densely developed areas, even, even by suburban standards. Uh, and there simply were not opportunities to provide a continuous route along the north side of the river, which was the reason why two crossings were being envisioned. Uh, the other, like I said, was related to opportunity and that's that the industrial track which connects Wilmington to Newcastle was already largely in development. Uh, CMAC funding has already been obtained for a new bridge across the Christina River. It's actually a, uh, a signature span that will be visible from I-95 and really serve as a, a billboard to increase awareness of pedestrian and bicycle options in the state. Uh, and the other one is likely to be uh, a much lower level kind of boardwalk type of span where the river is much narrower. Ann Marie, it looks like we have a couple of questions here for you. Um, the first is, interesting, what data did you present to the legislators to convince them that the sidewalks were less costly than buses? And how did you deal with the parental resistance to children walking, risk of bullies, cold weather, all that? We didn't have to address the issue of resistance from parents. The, the state law is that within two miles of a high school, you have to walk if the infrastructure is there. So the, the data that was presented to the, the state budget office and the legislators was I, I got the cost of operating two buses per year from the transportation director for the school district, which is what we anticipated it would take for that north side of Route 8. And that was, I believe, about $75,000 a year. So within, you know, 10 years, well, less than 10 years, because I think it was about a half million dollar improvement, um, you know, the, the sidewalks pay for themselves from an operational standpoint. And, and again, once you, once you 
start that operation, it's very hard to pull back from it because that's when you get the, the parental resistance. You've, you've bust my kid to school for five years, why are you going to make them walk now? So it, it was very important to, to try to at least get the, the closest walkers to be able to walk from the very beginning for that reason. Uh, we have a follow-up question that just came in. Uh, were any projections made on the number of students or teachers who might or would use bicycles to, or walking as a means of transportation to school? There, there were projections on the number of students that lived within the walk zone. So that those were provided by the, the school district's transportation supervisor. As it relates to teachers, not really. You know, unfortunately, when you look at our transportation numbers in, in Dover and a lot of southern Delaware, the non-motorized trips are a very low percentage, so that tends to not be a driving factor. So, so we're not looking at what we would anticipate and planning for that. We're trying to plan to make it accessible so that maybe we can start to change people's behaviors. It seems that Anne Marie is uh, really popular today. Um, was the 100 bike parking capacity selected on the basis of a demand study or, or other specific source of information? We require one, in our code, we require one bicycle parking space for every 20 vehicle parking spaces, and that's just the minimum bicycle parking standard. You know, I, I think in the case of a school, we will continue to monitor the use of the bike racks once they're installed and work with the school district to try to get them to install additional if the demand seems to be there. And I don't anticipate a problem again. Bike racks tend to be a fairly inexpensive piece of infrastructure. The, the tougher part is providing the safe path of travel for cyclists. And again, Route 8 isn't the best of roads to, to bike on, but um, it, it's done. So, uh, one last question, Gary. Did any of the any of the trails involve a, a rail converting a rail say a rail right away to trails? No, no. So the the whole river walk was basically either outright purchase or right. Um, was it, it was a combination. Uh, either the land was purchased, donated, or we extracted uh, from uh, developers who were along the Mississippian River. Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I, Christine, we're at our end, so we're at, at the end of our, our, our time at least. All right. Thank you. This was really great and um, well put together. This was wonderful um, and perfect timing. So uh, thank you to all of our speakers and our moderator and all the people in the background helping out with this and, of course, the Delaware chapter. Thank you for hosting this. Um, and that, that wraps up our session for today. So um, thank you, everyone. And again, you can kind of see some wrap-up, some websites there. And uh, remember to log those uh, CM credits and to check out uh, our YouTube channel for a video of this sometime next week. So thanks, everybody, um, and have a great weekend.